this green set is a neighborhood around X that's within the, the, the bright red set. Help. Why does that contradict anything about our construction? Someone I haven't heard from yet. Why does this contradict anything about our construction? Hmm. Thoughts? John, any thoughts? Apparently not. Any thoughts here? Maya? Excellent. Why? G G yeah, this red set is going to be a finite, in fact, not just a finite subcover, but it by itself, a single element will cover one of these intervals. Which one? Will it cover this first one? Second one? Yeah. In fact, because I'm having these at every stage, would you agree eventually these intervals get so small that they'll live inside the green set and therefore inside the big bright red set? Excellent. That's our contradiction. So the existent R, a radius around this point that's within G sub alpha by uh, Cyclops smiley, uh, some I sub n is completely contained in n sub r of x, meaning what? Well, this means that a single g sub alpha hat <laughs> covers i n, which contradicts what? Uh, double smiley. And we're in good shape. Okay. Very, very nice uh, argument uh, to show that AB is compact. It, it's actually, you know, surprisingly non trivial to show that this one creature is compact. Okay? But it's going to give us a lot of other things uh, as a relatively easy consequence. Okay? We're about to see that. Any questions about this proof? Yes, Willie. Uh huh. Excellent question. Willie's question was, what if these were open, this was an open interval? What would fail in this proof to show that the open interval is compact, which we know it's not? Hint. <coughs> this closed interval is just like the open interval except the endpoints, right? So what could happen? Excellent. The, the, the intersection of these blue sets could be one of the endpoints, and that's the case where you'll, you'll have problems with this argument. Okay. Wonderful question. Other questions about this proof? It is, uh, it does, it, it, it takes a second to step back and, and, and think about uh, why this is true. So I, I strongly encourage you to go back and review this proof idea. Okay. This picture says a lot. Okay. Yes, Laura. Excellent, uh, excellent question. Uh, Laura's question was, is, would this be sufficient, this kind of argument be sufficient for your writing? Um, so we, we are getting to the point in the, in, the, the, in, the, in, in the class now where you're beginning to be more and more mature, and you're assuming more and more mature things about your, your reader. And so I would say uh, it would be, if you're going to write a proof, this is the first, this is the first approximation. Right? And if you felt like your audience would not understand the having argument, you might put a little you know, asterisk and, and uh, demonstrate that. But if, if you're writing to somebody who's you know, two weeks behind you in the course, I, I think this is, this is pretty good. This has all the basic ideas that you want. Okay. I mean, you can stop being you know, technical. Right? At this point in, in, in the class, you can stop saying by the commutative or associative property of addition, right? which I noticed many of you are still doing on your exam. Um, 
unless you know one of those properties is really the crux, right? But what's the critical idea here? It's it's not in the the little detail, right? But I, I think I don't know. Let me ask you: Would you be happy with this kind of argument if you were the reader? Does somebody need to show that if you have a something eventually, it will get within a certain radius? I guess if the answer to that for you is yes, then you should write it out. But for me, it's this is probably fine. Okay. It's it's a bit of an art. I know it feels a little uneasy because you feel like okay, mathematics, everything needs to be pinned down. But it's a bit of an art to decide what it is your reader needs to see. Okay, so uh, hopefully you're developing some sense of that uh, now. Okay, excellent. So uh, nice, a nice argument. But now let me show you how easy it is then, once we have this, to prove uh, the next major theorem, uh, which is the heine borel theorem. Your book doesn't use this terminology, but everybody uh, these days knows this name. So now we can show, yes. Yeah, uh, so uh, the, ex the, the question was, uh, I why are we using open sets to consider uh, for covers? Why would it ever be interesting to look at closed covers? Uh, and th the answer is actually coming in a couple of theorems when we talk about Cantor's intersection theorem. So you can, you can develop the whole theory of compactness using just closed sets. Uh, but then uh, instead of unions that cover, you're going to be talking about intersections that are finite. Um, but perhaps you're asking a deeper question, which is why open covers at all, right? Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a harder question to answer. Um, we, we, yeah, so we'll be talking about, well, so let me come back to that when we, when we do Cantor's intersection theorem. Okay, so now we can show the heine borel theorem. which basically characterizes which sets are uh, in R or in RK if you have k-dimensional uh, k-tuples, uh, k-dimensional space, uh, Euclidean space, uh, which sets are compact. So in R or RK, k is compact if and only if k is both closed and bounded. Some of you guessed this theorem last time. I'm going to box this uh, because it, it really is it's such a key theorem. Uh, and then we'll try to prove it. Oh, thank you. Yes, I should maybe say Rn. Yes, that it's not get k's unrelated to the other k. Thank you. OK. Proof. Uh, let's see, which direction would you like to do first? <laughs> yeah, forward direction we've done already. We've both shown that a set is compact. Uh, if it's compact, it's closed. And if it's compact, it's bounded. Yes? In fact, we even reviewed the proof right at the beginning of class today. OK, so what about the reverse direction? And here is a very, very important place to uh, point out that the reverse direction is not true in arbitrary metric spaces. The question was, is the forward direction true in arbitrary metric spaces? And if you think back to the proof, the answer is yes. Those arguments we did with the, 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 uh, the pictures and we drew balls. There was nothing special about it being uh, RK, uh, a Euclidean space. So forward direction is always true. The backward direction is not true in arbitrary metric spaces. And I encourage, I challenge you to think of some examples uh, before we finish this proof. Okay, and then we'll we'll say some examples. 
Okay, great. So, um, how do 